Hey everyone, I'm Rather Incoherent, and today I want to talk about my top 10 favorite enemy cards in Arkham Horror. I was originally going to make a top 5, and as I got the list down, it became very apparent that it was a top 10. There were too many cards that I really, really liked, and I didn't want to cut any of them. But I do have an honorable mention, and as I thought I could hang out while I'll give the obvious spoiler warning, that if you are in this video, I will be showing you enemies from the game that might, like your first reaction to them is sometimes very, very cool, and Azathoth is one such enemy. Because like many of the Ancient Ones, you can't hit Azathoth. In fact, the first line of text in this, this isn't flavor text, it's not italicized. The rules text on Azathoth is Azathoth is oblivious and omnipotent. It is immune to all player cards and investigator actions that cannot be defeated by any means. That's not flavor text. Azathoth is omnipotent is a rules clarification. I love that. Azathoth sets the mood better than almost any other card in the game when you finally get to Before the Black Throne, and I feel like he's a great place to have an honorable mention. Yes, he's not really an enemy, but I do love him to death. And I have one more honorable mention, it's the Beast of Aldebaran, and it's because I don't actually like it for the enemy that it is. I like it for what it represents in Path to Carcosa. If you aren't aware, there are scenarios in Path to Carcosa where you set Beast of Aldebaran aside, and in one of them, it literally cannot spawn in that scenario. It's just set aside to fuck with you as a meta joke about unreliable narrators and going crazy. And in another one, it can technically spawn, but it's like a 1 in 9 chance if you do badly and make bad decisions. I love the position it fills in the campaign for very different reasons from Azathoth, but the main thing making it an honorable mention is that it's not really anything to do with the enemy that causes it to be so likable to me. The conglomeration of spheres is my number 10. This thing is a problem. Six health and you can't use melee cards is an insane bullet tax. It's not easy to trip with four. The prey and the hunter barely matter. The big thing that keeps this from being higher is that it doesn't fill the right role in the campaign. For me, I want to see Conglomeration of Spheres show up early in a campaign, and then that whole campaign is just filled with melee hate. If you're going to telegraph that melee weapons are unusable in Scenario 1, that theme should be repeated throughout the campaign. Because it's not, because the promise of Conglomeration of Spheres isn't fulfilled, it's a lot less good. If Dunwich was defined by melee weapons getting destroyed or negated constantly, Conglomeration of Spheres would be substantially higher on this list because of how well it informs the player on how to build their decks in Scenario 1. Instead, it's just a random curveball that is a massive problem. But I still like him. He's still very unique and very scary. And he affects how you're building your decks going into Dunwich. And generally speaking, if something's impacting your tech choices, I like it more. Number 9 is the Droning Horde. This one's just funny. It's got Swarming 6. It's not done yet. It also has Swarming Players as well except they come from your hand instead of your deck. This is gonna be like a swarming 8, 9, 10 card. It's just ridiculous. I mean, sure, it's threatening and scary because of that. The thing technically hits for more health than most players have, but mostly I just like it because it's hilarious when you summon the Droning Horde and you're like, oh, that's a lot of swarming cards. And you'll often find yourself asking, like, how many swarm cards does it have? And the answer is it doesn't matter. Keep hitting it. I really like just how funny having a swarming number this large is. For my number eight, it's the Grey Weaver. Grey Weaver is just a really scary enemy. You might look at this and be like, four, five, three with Hunter and you can't leave unless you dodge it? It hits for three total? Dear Lord, that's like a scenario four or five enemy. That thing's scary as hell. No, that's a scenario one enemy and there's two of them. There's in the victory deck. They don't spawn under a condition. You get them randomly in pileups with other, with other enemies. They're terrifying. This is a huge part of why, um, what's it called? Waking Nightmare is such a hard scenario. And it's also a huge part of why generally that half of the campaign can be viewed as hard in the first place, especially for fighters. Grey Weaver is just a straight up terrifying enemy. There were a lot of enemies I considered picking as my sort of poster child for big scary enemies that just hang out in the encounter deck. You've got like Aquatic Abomination at the end of Endsmith. In a Yig scenario in Forgotten Age, you have just like a giant fish that lives in the cave. It's just in the encounter deck. There's no explanation. It's just there and a problem. Grey Weavers, I think, are the best example of it because they come the earliest and they're the most recursive of the big threatening enemies. I would like to see more stuff like this in Arkham. This guy's just terrifying and I love him for it. 
Speaking of Yig scenario, my number eight is just straight up Yig. Yig is one of the scariest enemies in the game. If, like me, you were playing Forgotten Age, you realized Yig was the big bad, you were very surprised when Yig just showed up and you weren't in the finale yet. Additionally, Victory 5 is hilarious. He's massive hits for 3 3, that's full Ancient One numbers. He's got 6 plus 6 scaling health. He will chase you down if he has friends, and he will, by the way. This scenario is designed to make sure he does. Then you have to kill them first. And by the way, they have Retaliate and Alert now. Just in case you thought you were going to dodge them and run away, it's still scary. Yig is my favorite straight up boss enemy in the game, and in no small part, it's because Yig is just straight up the hardest boss enemy in the game. They put Yig in a scenario designed to make you run away from him. Just in case you thought there was a chance you could take Yig, the rest of the scenario is there to make sure that you can't and that you run for your life. Yig is the best boss enemy and the best boss fight scenario in the game. I really, really enjoy Yig. Now, moving on from here, we start getting into cards that are much more complicated in how they affect scenarios, much more intricate in why I like them. My number seven is the Moonbound Biaki. I really like this guy. Typically, the way he works is early in the scenario, when your alarm level is low, he spawns with you, but he ignores you. Late in the scenario, he spawns behind you and he hunts after you. And one way or another, you end up in a position where he notices you, he starts chasing after you, and you're running from him through the moon. And it's a really cool play pattern and loop. He's very, very threatening as a hunter that hits for 3-1, but he's only got three fists, three health. He's very killable. He's very trippable. He's very fair, and he very, very effectively pushes the gameplay on Dark Side of the Moon in a very specific direction. He's a really good enemy at shaping how you play a scenario, and he's also just like the right level of threatening and interesting. I really enjoy Moon Down the Eye. My number five is the Web Spinner. It's not a particularly threatening enemy, and honestly, on the surface, it doesn't look very interesting. It spawns far away, it plays this dude. Big whoop. It's aloof, it's going to take an additional action to get to it and kill it. It's basically an in-game rat, right? But my experience in that scenario has consistently been that getting to web spinners is a very, very difficult. And because that doom doesn't go away in the scenario, it's a really important driving force in the scenario to try not just to kill web spinners, but to end your turns in a way where you can really effectively ensure that you can kill a web spinner if one should spawn immediately. Web spinners are one of the more interesting cards to play around in proactive ways and I really, really enjoy just how threatening they are if you let them get out of hand and how that drives the play patterns in its scenarios. And getting out of the hand is exactly what Whippoorwills do. Whippoorwills are not a big deal. It's a 2-1-4 aloof hunter, so it's following you, but it's not doing nothing. It's not making all your stats worse by one. One's not a big negative, it's fine. There's lots of other enemies in this scenario who probably don't have time to deal with this stupid bird, and it's fine, it's not doing much until you draw the second bird, and now they're both there, and you get minus two to everything. And you know, now that you think about it, two is actually a three if you're getting a minus one to fist. It's not actually that easy to hit. And now that there's two of them, they basically have four fist, and no one can do anything next to them, and you're just running from the birds at this point. Maybe you can take them? You're still busy with the mobsters. I'm, uh, we'll get to the birds next turn. And then the third one spawns. And at that point, it's like, all right, the birds can have this location. We're leaving. And the birds will chase you. You're gonna have to keep leaving wherever you work so the birds will follow you to the ends of the earth. Beat Cop is like an S-tier card in Dunwich because of these damn birds. These birds are one of the scariest, most out of control cards when they start to pile up, and I love them. They are so, so problematic when things get out of hand, and things getting out of hand is why I love Blood on the Altar specifically. They are at their best in that scenario, and honestly, that scenario is just Arkham at its best if you take the Mafia route. Coming over to my number three, we've got the Vengeful Serpent. It's a 2-2-2 two, two, two enemy, what, who cares? It'll chase you down, sure. It's got Vengeance Zero, so you kill it, it goes to the display, but wait, Vengeance Zero, that doesn't matter. Because what actually happens is after you draw a Vengeful Serpent, you get all the ones you've killed before now too. So the first one's not a problem, and maybe even the second one's not a problem, but how many bullets did you pack? Because this chump looking basic ghoul enemy it's not a two of basic ghoul that you just kill twice. This represents 12 health of snakes you gotta chew through. They are a huge problem. They're one of the best things in Return to Forgotten Age is they replace like a meaningless nothing enemy with this guy. And they are so, so problematic. Much like with Conglomeration of Spheres, Eventual Serpent tells you you have to play this campaign differently. Bring more bullets or bring melee weapons. Or have non-lethal ways of dealing with snakes. 
because if your plan is just to shoot snakes with guns, not only will that piss you off, you're probably gonna run out of bullets. And I love how very effectively Vengeful Serpent fits into that picture. My number two enemy is the Catacombs Docent. And you might look at the Catacombs Docent and be briefly confused if you don't remember the scenario that well. He's a 3-2-2, he hits for one horror, he doesn't even spawn with you, he doesn't hunt you either. And if you go to him, you can look at a location far away that's not even that useful, but war is kind of hard even. Why would I want to do this? And the answer to that is that you aren't going to talk to him with this book four test. You're going to talk to him with a gun because he's not my number two. My number two is Corpse Dweller, who is inside of the catacombs, docent. It is just a matter of time. Sure, you can leave the old man alone in the catacombs, but it won't end well for you because eventually he's going to explode into this guy and then he'll hunt you down. And he's a 3-5 that hits for two with retaliate. And there are other problems in the scenario. Like, yeah, going out of your way to kill the Catacombs docent isn't good. It takes actions. You have to reveal the location. All of that's problematic. But if it turns into a corpse thrower, it might go from an inconvenience to a nightmare very quickly. It's thematically one of the best combinations of cards in the entire game. And honestly, I wish corpse thrower were a little bit scarier. I wish he had four fist or like seven health. I wish this thing were an even more nightmarish issue to really reinforce the problem. And if it were, it would probably be my number one. Now, if you've been watching me for a long time, you've heard me talk about how much I love Before the Black Throne for a while. And you know specifically that it's one card. There's a lot of things that really fit together for Before the Black Throne to be my favorite scenario. But there's one card above all others that defines that scenario. It's my number one enemy. It's the Mindless Dancer. This is a 6-5 enemy. It's got three foot. It's relatively dodgeable. Slight problem. It spawns in an empty space. You can't go there. And it's a hunter. And it can move through the empty spaces, unlike you, but really importantly, it double hunts. So it is going to run up to you and attack you before you can actually evade it. It won't be at your location to be evaded when it spawns, and then it will come to you and beat the shit out of you. Now, in a lesser scenario, this would be a victory point enemy. No, this guy just gets discarded. You know what else happened in that scenario a lot? The encounter deck getting shuffled back in. You know what else happens a lot? The other two copies of Mindless Dancer, because there's three of them. They define the scenario. You go into that scenario and you start picking specific cards that kill non-elite enemies because he's not elite. This is just the way things are when you enter Azathoth's realm. Things are terrible there. So you need cards like Waylay that kill a 6-5 in one action without interacting, well, two actions, without interacting with their fist. That's the important part. These guys are absolutely terrifying and they are one of the most defining problems in that scenario. There are others. It's just hard on the time pressure. Acolytes spawn with doom that you have to clear, otherwise it becomes permanent, but they're far away and unreachable. There are so many things in that scenario that are hard and difficult, but can be tacked around and played around that make it a wonderful scenario. And Mindless Dancer is easily the most iconic and difficult of them. If your plan in that scenario is to kill Mindless Dancer over and over again, like it's possible. If you're playing like a high soak fighter with a flamethrower, you absolutely can just let them slap you and kill them repeatedly. But it is not an easy path through that scenario. It is very difficult to try to bulldoze through this. And that'll be it for my top 10 enemies. There's a good mix of enemies that are just like really thematically problematic or just directly mechanically problematic. My favorite ones are enemies that are both like the Corpse Dweller and even like the Mindless Dancer. I really enjoy when mechanical problems line up with thematics super well. And usually I only get one or the other, but there are a lot of cards that excel in one or the other. I'd love to hear what your favorite enemies are down in the comments. And if you did like the video, like, subscribe, all that stuff really does help the channel grow. I wouldn't mind. And either way, I've been Rather Incoherent, and I'll see you in the next one.